Thank you. So we are here, uh, friends of the mining industry, and I've been an investor in this sector for, I always say 20 years, but it's probably 22 or 23 years. Opened my first account with Haywood Securities in 1995. I always tell my friends what, what software and computers are to Seattle is what commodities and energy are to Western Canada. I grew up in it. And effectively, if you look at an announcement that we made yesterday, I'm involved with uh, a junior company called Copper Bank, and we made an acquisition. We're like carpenters. You measure seven times, you cut once. Very carefully, over the past two years, we've been looking for an acquisition opportunity. I will give you the highlights on that later, but the first question is why copper? I was on Bloomberg two years ago, and I was um, of the continuing theme that I believe the commodity of copper is going to decouple from the commodity complex in general. And these are the arguments. I have 13 and one half minutes to do what I usually do over 45 minutes. It will be an accelerated uh, demonstration of data points, I hope in a very colorful way. So we collectively as an industry, we need to echo and amplify this very important messages to the generalist investors around the world because they're the ones that are gonna write the checkbook or write the check for your future financing. You have three lines here. We effectively are looking at the energy commodities. I do put aluminum together with copper and oil. If we start back in 2000, uh, before the big super cycle, which was then China, you can see that the dominance of oil, highs are always met, and it's a monolithic group. You really could have put a, probably put 10 or 15 different commodities here. The highs are with the highs, lows are with the lows, and this is now decoupling. I believe, I believe that copper is going to be a commodity that perhaps surpasses its old all-time high sooner than the other commodities. If you can stretch your mind once again within this graphic, you can see going back to 2000, if oil is the dominant commodity, if it was to uh, maintain this, if and when copper was to surpass its old all-time high, that would effectively be like oil in the $140, $150 a barrel area. I don't believe this is going to take place. I follow energy very carefully, and if you look at these energy commodities, Copper, 75% of all the copper fabricated in the world is used in something to create, transfer, or utilize electricity. Oil, which is now about 98, 99 million barrels a day of demand, is used in many different products. When you crack one barrel of oil, you, you get under with about 45 products. And what I'm trying to show you here, as I'll highlight it, is the three or the four areas where 55% uh, of the world's oil is used. Transportation fuels, road, trans road transport, road freight, the maritime trade in aviation. Collectively, 55% of all the oil used in the world is used for transportation. So it can be said that big transportation is the biggest cu single customer of big oil. The experts in oil, which would be uh, any economists from all the big companies, I follow Spencer Dale of BP, and you can look at uh, Shell and their scenarios, and you can also look at Fatih Birol and what they do at the IEA, and they forecast, and the, con the consensus there is that the demand for oil will continue to grow, nor muted, but somewhere in 2040, we should see somewhere about 110, 110 million barrels a day of demand. When you put in innovation, adoption, technology, fuel switching, you end up with a totally different picture. There's a delta of some 40 million barrels of oil. Now, I can't tell you where that's going to end up. I will suggest to you, if we look at some more evidence, that the demand, the demand for oil based on transportation fuels is going to peak, in my opinion, faster than most people recognize. I think more, more, faster than most people are going to appreciate. The energy mix, which is all based on the consumer, if the consumer, which is industry and the general public, if they change their behavior, or if the requirements that they have, or if there are governmental pressures that are being put in place all over the world, I, I speak of the Paris Accords of 2015, there is a shift happening. The way we create energy, transfer it, and utilize it is going through a pivot. And if we look at the example I gave from 1938, where they, Everett de Gaulle stated that the oil discovery in Saudi Arabia was the single greatest prize in all history, uh, I can then suggest that if we were to disintermediate the old system, that then is the new greatest prize in all history. 
Sarah Week did take place. It was in early March. I follow this every year. Uh, there was some 48 different plenaries, and there was the most profound statement, which I will get to in a moment. You can see here Mr. Burkini, Mr. Bokindo, who's the uh, chairman of OPEC, and of course Fatih Barul himself, questioned by Dan Jurgen. Ben Van Buren, in his speech, he does recognize that they are no longer the biggest companies in the world. We all know that if you looked at the 10 or 20 largest corporations publicly listed in the world for 100 years, it would typically be big auto, big oil, big bank. They are all subordinate to big technology now. The 10 largest companies in the world are of, of, a, of a technology basis, and we all know this. They are subordinate, everyone is, to this wave of big technology. It was interesting when Ben Van Buren talked about climate change. It was no longer a speech. He took out a piece of paper and he was reciting what the board of directors would tell him. I found it fascinating. He says today they're 50-50 oil and gas, and that will pivot. He doesn't say conclusively the number, but somewhere around 75% natural gas to make electricity and 25% in the oil business. Bob Dudley, who runs British Petroleum, he stated that if what we're looking for is emissions, and he said to Sarah Week, that hypothetically, if all transportation was electrified tomorrow with a magic wand, it doesn't change the emissions because the electricity to make, the, the, the source of the electricity to fuel these electric cars would negate any emission, any emission benefits you have in the transportation. This is an appalling statement. If you have accelerated adoption scenarios, if that's the case with transportation, one cannot assume that the source of the electricity shall stay static this too shall be assumed from an adopted scenario, which of course I'm talking about renewable energy and not thermal coal or natural gas powered electricity in perpetuity. Uh, Mr. Wang was sent by Xu Yinbiao of the state, uh, state grid of China and this was a, a laughing matter. And I found this to be uh, probably the most uh, lasting statement from Sarah Week. Many times they were making fun of him because he said when he charges his car in the Chinese uh, grid network, he does exercise for 20 or 25 minutes. And then the, Dan Jurgen laughed and said that basically we learned one thing, that when you're charging your electric car, you can do your exercise. And oddly enough, after four days, the final statement of Sarah Week 28 was that. Dan Jurgen said to the Konishenti of Energy, and we learned that when you charge your car, you can do exercise. They don't appreciate that this pivot is already underway. Uh, Sadiq Khan, who's the mayor of London, we're all aware that he, they're looking, not just London, but cities around the world, to eliminate the usage of these fossil fuels. And of course, I'm speaking about particulate pollution, which is uh, predominantly operated by the internal combustion engine. What about the money? What about the money? The most profound statement was from Samir Asaf of HSBC. He was on a panel with five executives, four oil, uh, oil and gas executives and himself. He says HSBC, in, incorrect here by the way, of course it's a UK firm, but they have it as US. But uh, the, four, the four largest banks in the world are Chinese, then you have HSBC and then you have the rest. And he told them like this, he said, my money is constrained. Because of the Financial Stability Board, the FSB, in the financial crisis, they are mandated to list line item for line item where their exposure is in the year 2022 this will then become a very open document. He says today HSBC has 30 billion of exposure on the balance sheet to oil and gas, 1 billion in renewables. And he made the proclamation that by 2025, they will have $100 billion of exposure to the finance of renewable energy. And of course, like Ben Van Buren said, it's about making investment happen. The money matters and it should be looked upon with all other investors. And there's the number here, that how this exposure will be with uh, oil and gas is yet to be determined. So the question we ask ourselves, is this the beginning to the end of the oil age? Well, that's a really easy prescription to write, but a much harder one to take. It's gonna be jurisdictionally challenged. It depends where you live. What is your natural endowment? And if we look at the map that I actually I talked about in the panel, this embellishes those economies that export oil. The higher the price of the oil, and the more oil you export, the more embellished the country is. We do not see China, we do not see India, we do not see Japan, Germany, Italy at all. There is a choice now, and it's a pivot that is already underway, and I think we can look back at certain dates uh, of those, uh, of, of, in those moments. And I will suggest to you that on October, uh, November 27th, 2014, at the OPEC meeting, this was the day of capitulation. 
This is when Saudi Arabia said, we are no longer the swing producer. If 55% of all oil is used in transportation fuels, when you make the internal combustion engine more efficient, you use less petroleum products. Does anyone dispute that fact of science? 45% of all the world's electricity is used by a motor. There will be countless billions more of electrical motors in every facet of the global economy. When you make the electrical motor more efficient, or when you adopt into it, you use more copper. This is entirely unappreciated. China is, in fact, the world's largest automobile market. This is where we need to look. It is the most important market for all the incumbent automotive manufacturers, full stop. And they have given notice that in such and such years, there shall be at le uh, highly efficient vehicles and or, of course, the electrification of transportation. I was in San Francisco on CNBC and they quoted me, and I like this picture, so I use it in, uh, in demonstrations. I do believe that innovation technology um, and adoption, these are the best friend of the copper business because of course I speak about electricity and that electricity requires copper. I just went to two weddings, uh, this is me charging in Slovenia and it's a very progressive state and they've allowed the chargers to be placed at the gas stations. I was also at the farm and you can see here that it works. You just plug it in the wall. Anywhere you have electricity, I get 11 kilometers for each one hour I wait. Now, you're not going to charge it that way. I've driven across Europe in a Tesla. I've driven across America in a Tesla. And yes, I understand that this is uh, perhaps the most progressive company to this point. Unscientifically, but hopefully mathematically accurate, who in this audience has driven in one day 800 kilometers in an electric car? Raise your hand. I will suggest to you that you do not appreciate that the future is now and this technology works. I encourage you to do this. I did it once again with a very skeptical person. I did it across America. We arrived in Florence, Italy from Croatia at exactly the same time it would have taken with a gasoline car, assuming you have to go to the restroom and you want to have some lunch. This is the modern example. This is the solar roof, battery, and a car. And if you can uh, look at this in the coming years, this disintermediates everything. The average American house, traditionally 400 pounds of copper, haven't done the maths, but it's over 1,000 pounds would be in such a house. So we lose in the grid, but we gain in the structure. And the leaders, of course, are the Chinese. 75% of the Chinese leadership are engineers. The American politi political base, of course, are Lawyers, they learn how to argue for a living. It's no longer made in China. It's innovated, developed, and exported the world from China. He knows this. The, what is now the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman Al Saud, came to America about six weeks ago, gave a fantastic interview in Time Magazine, 10,000 words. I encourage everyone to read that. He, together with SoftBank, are building a 200 gigawatt solar park in Saudi Arabia. They will do many things with that, and I can't go into the, the greater details, but effectively, he, the grandchildren are now running the country, and their choice was to be contrarians or victims, and that's a Rick rule. I don't know if he's in the audience. He's a contrarian. He knows, effectively, what the last century was to the oil business. The next century will belong to the copper business. I embellish Chile here. It's the world's largest producer of copper, some five and a half million tons, but it will be all those places that have a copper endowment. There will be, I believe, greater investment between the states that are now diversifying away from petroleum products into everything that can fabricate, transfer, and utilize electricity in all its forms. And of course, that will be copper as well. So I think that people that are going to invest in your companies are going to be like the Stanford Pension Fund, Harvard. Anyone that is now seriously looking, it's five and a half trillion dollars. The two lead investors in the divestment movement now are going to be, it's no longer stat oil, they're now called Equinor, Equinor, and the, and the, the, the Norwegian State Pension Fund, which is supplied from a, a, the petroleum endowment of the country, and Saudi Arabia. I believe it's a trillion dollars that he's allocated, 500 billion to start with, which will climb to a trillion dollars. They don't call it electricity, but that's exactly what renewable energy is. So I do believe that this, the fabrication of these things 
This is me at my brother's house, and there's that 500 MCM cable, which I got my brother to bring home. It's the strands. See how fine they are? You can't do that with aluminum. It's the flexibility and the labor that you save. Because typically, the thick strands, which we use in aluminum cabling, is very rigid. So a lot, lot harder to, to install. I don't have the time to go into all the applications, but aluminum will be part of the solution. But copper, copper is the brains of the system. And of course, we have to remove friction and resistance, which means you, you gravitate typically to copper away from, from aluminum. The bean counters have come to the conclusion as well. Of all the major commodities, the only one that has a positive CAGR growth rate is copper. There it is. I don't care if you want to use 3% or 5%. 24 million tons, 4 million from scrap, 4 million from cathodes. That falls off a cliff, as we all know. It'll be below 3 million tons in the next five years. And concentrates. World's oil supply comes from 4,700,000 individual wells. Primary copper, 20 mines. They don't know that at Sarah Week. They don't discuss it. They don't understand that the average discovery year of these mines was 1928. They don't care. The copper's just there. It follows the oil market. If you look at the R&D of the business, we as an industry invested $150 billion. That's the red line. Gray bars are what we found. It's not coming. We found lots of low grade, but the choice pickings are gone. So the grade that I talked about on my panel, 2010, 1.2%. That's now 0.72. But this is the future of mining right here. All that stuff we found. We have lots of copper, I don't want to call it reserve, but resource, 0.3 to 0.5%. And if you, once again, just to finish off, I know we got 60 seconds here, but this is important, that we as an industry don't have to spend money on feasibility studies. They're too expensive. Just show them this, that at 0.5% copper, right now it's worth $33 a ton. That's not a business. It's okay if you have a mine, but if you're trying to finance a new mine, it doesn't work. Let me give you $4 copper. It's worth $44. That's why I believe that because of the future of this business is either going to be in exotic locations or at higher elevations, deeper, with greater infrastructure requirements, everything has to be paid for, that you need to have that 20 to 30% IRR buffer, and that's only possible with higher copper prices. The magic window that you have in the industry, supplied by my friends at the International Copper Study Group, after Cobra Panama goes online, we go through a supply vacuum for three years. There are no mines greater. I think the largest one will be 110,000 tons. Three-year vacuum. They don't talk about this at Sarah Week. So I believe what's going to happen in the future is this. I can't tell you the exact price. I just think that copper is going to have to enable a 0.3 or 0.4% copper deposit to become economic. If you reverse engineer that, we're going to need somewhere about 11, 12,000 a ton. That would suggest that copper goes somewhere in this area here sometime in the future. If you go back to the long-term average, that's effectively oil going $160, $180 a barrel. Fundamentals are the driver of the copper business, and I will suggest to you that politics Politics is the biggest driver in oil markets. And just like the farmers are saying now, the weather is not the biggest factor in our business, it's politics. Copper, unfortunately, has fundamentals. I encourage you to follow our uh, progress at Copper Bank. Uh, we announced the acquisition of Red Hawk Resources yesterday. We would like to speak with everyone here. Me and my partner will be coming back to London. We have a lot of hard work to do. We don't take salaries. We're the largest shareholders of our company. We throw pennies around like manhole covers. If you're looking for optionality with growth in copper, we would like to speak with you. We are fully aligned with that mentality, and we encourage you to follow our future news flow. We are very aggressively going to be looking at this buying opportunity in the market. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat>